Welcome to the South Defense. Okay, let's unpack this. In the high stakes world of advanced military aviation, you know, it's usually dominated by a few familiar names. So what happens when a new player uh, sort of enters the arena? We're talking about Turkey's indigenous fighter jet program, the KAN. And well, there's some very recent news suggesting it's making waves globally. That's right. The KEN, it isn't just another project. It really represents Turkey's uh, most ambitious step yet towards developing its own high-performance fifth-generation fighter, you know, designed to stand alongside jets like the F-35 and F-22. It's a massive undertaking uh, and a clear statement of intent. And our deep dive today, it's built entirely on what's reported in one specific source, an article from BulgarianMilitary.com published just yesterday, May 26, 2025. It details, apparently, significant international interest that has surfaced for the KN. Exactly. So based only on the nuggets of information this article provides, our mission here is to, well, cut through the noise. We want to understand which countries are reportedly showing interest right now, explore the motivations the source gives them, and, you know, think about what this buzz tells us about the evolving landscape of the global defense market. Okay, so let's start with the foundation then. What exactly is the KN within the context of Turkey's own strategic goals, according to this article? Well, the source positions the KN as the centerpiece of Turkey's National Combat Aircraft Program, the MMU. Fundamentally, it seems driven by a desire for strategic autonomy, basically, reducing their reliance on foreign military tech, particularly the high-end systems. And the article points to a specific event that really uh, solidified this push for independence. Absolutely. A key factor cited is Turkey's removal from the F-75 program back in 2019. That followed their decision to buy the Russian S-400 air defense system. That whole experience, it seems, deeply influenced Turkey's resolve to develop domestic capabilities and, crucially, to become a significant defense exporter, too. Right, so they're building this for themselves, definitely, but also the global market firmly in sight. And the big news report in the article, it comes from Mehmet Demiroglu, the general manager of TOSI, that's Turkish Aerospace Industries. Mm -hmm. What did he reveal on May 25th? He announced that four distinct nations have now expressed a uh, formal interest in the KAA down program. Four nations. Wow. That's a significant number for a jet still, you know, in development. Who are they? According to the source, the countries are Kazakhstan, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Hmm. That's a pretty geographically diverse group. And does the article give us an update on how serious this interest actually is right now? It does. It notes that while no final binding contracts are signed yet with any of them, Demiroglu specifically mentioned that discussions with Malaysia and Kazakhstan have progressed. They're apparently at a more serious, active negotiation stage compared to the others. Okay, this is where it really gets interesting. Why these particular countries? What motivations does the article attribute to each? Let's uh, start with Saudi Arabia. The source suggests their interest has been building for a while. Yes, the article indicates Saudi interest isn't brand new, but it became particularly prominent in early 2025. It even cites some reports from Defense Security Asia back in January 2025, suggesting Saudi Arabia was exploring, acquiring a substantial number, maybe up to 100 jets. 100 jets. That's yeah. Yeah, That would be a massive order. How did this interest get formalized, according to the reporting? The formalization seems linked to a visit by Prince Turkey bin Bandar al Saud. He's the commander of the Royal Saudi Air Force to Turkey. And the discussions reportedly went beyond just a simple purchase. They talked about potential industrial cooperation, technology transfers, maybe even setting up local assembly lines in Saudi Arabia. Ah, okay. So a desire for joint development and domestic production, not just buying off the shelf. And what's driving this from the Saudi side, based on the article? Well, the source highlights years of uh, frustration over stalled F-35 talks with the U.S. It mentions U.S. concerns over Saudi ties with China and human rights records as, you know, contributing factors to those delays. But more broadly, the article frames it as part of a deliberate Saudi policy to diversify its defense suppliers, reduce dependency on traditional Western sources. Makes sense. And the KAN fits into their Vision 2030 goals, too, right? Bolstering air power and fostering a domestic aerospace industry. They seem attracted by the prospect of advanced capabilities, stealth, sensor fusion, multi-role stuff, coupled with what the article cites as a potentially competitive unit cost, somewhere between maybe 80 and $110 million. That definitely lays out a strong case diversification, building domestic capability costs. Okay, what about Indonesia? Their interest seems a bit more recent. Correct. The source reports Indonesia's interest really solidified in April 2025. 
That's when President Prabhu Subianto reportedly proposed joining the KAN development program during a meeting with Turkish President Erdogan. Interesting. But Indonesia is already a partner in South Korea's KF-21 fighter program, right? How does the article explain the KF-21 fitting into that picture? Yeah, that's a key point. The article states that Indonesia views the KAN as a complementary platform to their KF-21 involvement. It notes that the KF-21 program has faced some challenges, funding issues, data security concerns, things like that. The KN offers a twin-engine design, which is seen as appealing, and the source specifically points out its significantly higher payload capacity. Higher payload, how much? Up to 10 tons of munitions, apparently. The article notes this significantly exceeds the F-35's internal capacity. Indonesia also seems keen on deepening defense ties with Turkey. And, like Saudi Arabia, the article highlights Turkey's reported openness to tech-sharing and joint ventures as a major draw. Okay, a complementary approach then. Maybe spreading the risk, leveraging different strengths. Now, Kazakhstan and Malaysia, the source says, negotiations are further along there. Let's start with Kazakhstan. Right. For Kazakhstan, the article states they've moved beyond just initial interest into active negotiations. Their key motivations are presented as meeting to replace their aging fleet, you know, old Soviet-era MiG and Sukhoi jets with a modern strategic asset. It's about enhancing air defense capabilities, especially given regional security concerns and also strengthening ties with Turkey, described as a key regional ally. And the tech transfer aspect. That's a major attraction noted again. Turkey's willingness to offer technology transfers and joint production opportunities is highlighted. The source contrasts this with potentially stricter controls from more, let's say, traditional suppliers. Modernizing their air force and building a stronger defense relationship with a partner seen as flexible. Okay. And Malaysia. Malaysia is also in active negotiations. The article says they're exploring the KN to complement their current quite diverse fleet, which includes both Russian and Western aircraft. They seem to be facing budget constraints and operate in a complex threat environment. So Malaysia apparently sees the KN as a potentially cost-effective alternative compared to some pricier Western jets. And again, that, that theme of Turkey's flexibility regarding tech transfer and joint production comes up as a significant appeal. Right. So cost-effectiveness and that flexibility, those seem to be recurring themes driving interest across these different nations. Okay, let's shift focus now to the KN program itself. What does the article say about its current status and development timeline? According to Demiroglu's statements, cited in the source, the program is progressing steadily. The focus right now seems to be on constructing the second and third prototypes. And the first prototype, that's already flown. Yes. The first one made its maiden flight back in February 2024 and had a second test flight later that same year. These next prototypes, the second and third, they're intended for more extensive, rigorous flight testing. What kind of capabilities are they actually testing for? What are the key things? Well, the source notes they're evaluating critical performance areas, things like aerodynamic stability, engine performance, and crucially for a fifth gen jet, its stealth characteristics, its low radar cross section, you know, achieve through design and materials. They're also testing for features like supercruise, the ability to fly supersonic without constantly using afterburners, and verifying the performance of the advanced avionics suite. And what does that advanced avionics suite include, according to the source? What systems are we talking about? It's expected to include sophisticated systems like a ESA radar that's active electronically scanned array radar, really crucial for tracking multiple targets, handling electronic warfare simultaneously. It'll also integrate IRST sensors, infrared search and track, which passively detect heat signatures, making it harder to jam. Plus electronic warfare systems, E of you. And the article emphasizes sensor fusion. That's the critical ability to combine data from all these different sensors into one clear picture for the pilot, significantly boosting situational awareness. Okay, so testing everything from basic flight performance right up to complex sensor integration. What's the overall timeline looking like then, based on this article? According to Demi Roglu, the program is currently on track. He even suggests testing might wrap up sooner than initially planned, he attributes this possibility to the accelerated production of these follow-on prototypes. Hmm, that would be impressive if they can meet or even beat the schedule. Beyond testing, what are Turkey's plans for the KAN once development is complete, both for their own air force and for export? Domestically, the Turkish Air Force intends for the KAN to replace their aging fleets of F-16s and, believe it or not, F-4E Phantoms. Serial production is targeted to begin in 2028. Okay, 2028. And when would they actually start receiving the first jets? 
The source indicates the initial production batch, maybe 20 to 30 aircraft, is expected by 2030. Now, these early production models will use the current General Electric F-110 engines. But the long-term goal, a really ambitious one, is to transition to an indigenously developed engine by 2032. Ah, that would be the TF-35000 engine the source mentions. Yes, exactly. The TF-35000 aiming for 35,000 pounds of thrust. That would make the KN a very powerful aircraft indeed. The Turkish Air Force's overall goal is to have a fleet of at least 100 KN jets by the mid-2030s, aiming for air superiority and also fulfilling their NATO commitments. And on the export market, what's the strategy there? Well, their export strategy seems clearly aggressive. T.U. Zeshaf is actively seeking international partners. The article points to Azerbaijan joining the program back in 2023. And more recently, Pakistan's agreement in January 2025 to set up a joint production facility. These partnerships, they serve a dual purpose, right? Okay. Potentially lowering production costs, but also strategically positioning the KAN as a viable competitive option, especially perhaps for nations that might face restrictions buying fighters from, say, the U.S. or Russia. OK. All right. We've covered a lot of ground here based only on this Bulgarian military dot com report. We've talked about what the KAN is, why Turkey's building it, who's reportedly interested and their reasons, the program's current status and timeline and Turkey's own plans. So. Pulling all this together, what does this international buzz around the KAN really signal? Well, it really underscores that the KAN program isn't just an internal Turkish project anymore. It's actually gaining genuine traction on the global stage. The interest from these four nations, and especially the fact that negotiations with Kazakhstan and Malaysia are described as serious, suggests the KAN has the potential to become a real disruptor in the market for advanced fighters. It's presenting itself as a package combining advanced tech with potentially greater affordability and more strategic partnership flexibility compared to some established options. And for those nations showing interest, as the article details, it offers pretty diverse benefits. You know, a pathway to greater defense independence for countries like Saudi Arabia and Indonesia. Exactly. And a means for others like Kazakhstan and Malaysia to modernize their fleets while also maybe fostering their own domestic aerospace industries through that tech transfer. Precisely. It represents a potential shift from a purely buyer-seller dynamic towards co-development and production partnerships. And that's very appealing in many parts of the world right now. So this deep dive, grounded just in the reporting from BulgarianMilitary.com, it paints a picture of the KAN moving pretty rapidly from a national ambition to, well, a significant international contender, potentially signaling a new phase in global air power competition. It certainly seems that way. However, the article also implicitly acknowledges the substantial challenges ahead. I mean, let's be clear. Ultimately, the success of the KM program and its export potential hinges entirely on Turkey's ability to meet its ambitious development timeline. And critically, they have to prove that the jet can perform to the very high standards expected of a fifth generation fighter, matching the proven capabilities of existing aircraft. Questions about overcoming the complex technical hurdles, sustaining the immense financial and technical investment required, those are still very real. Absolutely. It's a long road. And here's something for you, our listener, to really consider. As flight testing on these prototypes continues, and as these uh, delicate international negotiations unfold, think about how the ultimate success or failure of the KAN program could have ripple effects far beyond just Turkey itself. It might not just alter Turkey's standing, but potentially influence military alliances and the balance of power in several critical regions, you know, from Central Asia to the Middle East and Southeast Asia. How might you see those dynamics shifting based on what happens with this project? It's definitely a development that warrants very close attention uh, from a global perspective going forward. A lot of pieces moving on the board indeed. Thanks for exploring this with us on The Deep Dive. Don't forget to hit subscribe if you want to stay ahead of the biggest shifts in aerospace, geopolitics, and defense innovation.